Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We are love for you to be a part of the JCC Sunday School family. Today our lesson is titled, Learning Contentment, and it's coming from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 18. As we continue in this journey of new life in Christ, this week we learn the necessity of being content. Chapter 4 speaks to us relying on God's strength in times of suffering, but it's in His strength that allows us to be content no matter what. We will learn as a result of reading our scripture today, this includes prayer, encouragement, and focusing on God's provision to see it through. So let's start our lesson out with question number one. How did Paul emphasize his challenge to rejoice? Let's read verses 4 and 5 to find out. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So to answer that question, we see that Paul repeats the word rejoice twice, and he's placing emphasis on it. The need to rejoice would not be overlooked or misunderstood if Paul had anything to say. So to truly learn contentment, one must learn to rejoice always. Joy is not just for good times, but for the hard times as well. And Paul tells the church to rejoice no matter what you find yourself in. See, but our rejoice is in the Lord, which means regardless of the circumstances, a child of God can still rejoice always in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is committed to us, we should also be committed to him. He's our ultimate source and the reason for our joy. Why? Because no matter what we go through, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. See, our circumstances and our feelings should never stop us from rejoicing, praying, giving thanks, showing respect, or acting kindly to others. Yes, rejoicing helps us to be content in the Lord. See, to let go and to let God when we rejoice, we do that in the Lord. Rejoicing is a great way to start our prayers to help us focus on Jesus and all that he has done for us. No matter what situation we're in, if we put emphasis on him, we can see that he endured more than we could ever begin to endure. So Paul's lesson of learning to be content is to put the emphasis on Christ and not the situation. What we place our minds on will ultimately determine our actions. We should place our minds on the promises of God, place them on the finished work that Christ did for us all. Question two says, what attitude were the Philippians to maintain towards other people? In verse 5, Paul exhorted them to manifest a spirit of moderation, which means to avoid excess or extreme behaviors towards other people. Basically, Paul is saying in order for us to truly learn contentment, it starts with gentleness to others. Just as they were to rejoice in the Lord at all times, so they were to be gentle to people at all times as well. He ends this verse by saying, the Lord is at hand, meaning one of two things, the Lord's return, or the Lord is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. I believe that Paul incentive gave them this challenge, that Jesus was coming back soon, that this here was the very thing that sustained Paul and should sustain them as well. There's a big lesson here for us, that we too can transcend our circumstances because we know that one day Jesus is coming back to receive us. In verse 7, Paul reminded them, that the peace of God that transcends human comprehension will guard their hearts and minds as if they were in a divine fortress for the kingdom of God. Notice what he says. It will guard their hearts and minds. Question three says, how did Paul teach the Philippians to win against worry in their lives? Let's read verse six and see. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, again, I want us to remember we're dealing a lesson on being content, learning how to be content. Basically, Paul is saying, 
Don't be anxious for nothing. He's telling the Philippians to pray about everything. See, prayer is turning to God for revelation. And he also says, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Now, supplication means to take a spiritual inventory in order to make your request known. So to learn to be content, we must first learn not to be anxious for anything. How do we do that? By turning to God in prayer so that we know the will of God for our lives. But in knowing the will of God for our lives, we take a spiritual inventory of the things we lack. Then we take it to the Lord in prayer. God knows what we lack. So we need to take what we lack to God so we can be all that we can be. He knows what we lack that is stopping us from being content. But we need to know it so that we can take it to God. We started a prayer study at our church where we focused on the scripture about prayer and various prayers in the Bible. And we use these here to how to improve our prayer life. I highly encourage it to any leader that might be listening to this lesson today. But I ask a question. Why does God need us to pray? He knows all things, so why does he need us to pray? And this may shock many. God wants your permission to intervene in your situation. That's why the word says we have not because we ask not. There's so much more to this, and I don't have time really now to get into it. But look throughout the Bible. When the prophets prayed for something, it came to pass, but it had to align with God's will. Praying amiss is a prayer that doesn't align with the will of God. So to be careful for nothing, we must know the things that hinder us from the will of God. What are the things in our lives that are hindering us from the will of God. And then we turn to God in prayer and make our petition known. Take those things, those supplications, take an inventory of those very things and then begin to pray for them to the Lord. See, in the case for this Sunday school lesson, this here allows us to be content. This brings us back to the thankfulness of what God has done in doing and will do in the future. God listened to the prayers of his children when they align with the will of his plan. And God will provide for us then. This makes us thankful knowing that God hears our prayer. And it helps to lead to us being more and more content. Now, question four says, what does God protect his people from anxiety? Let's refer to verse seven. And the people of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. God's peace surpasses all human understanding. An anxious thought can cloud our thinking so that we see no other way out from the problem. But God's peace, however, is more than enough for any situation in our lives. No worry can withstand the power of God's peace. God's peace gives us a spiritual contentment. So the answer to not being anxious is to have the peace of God in our heart. Question five says, what kind of thoughts could dominate a child of God's mind? Let's read verse eight and nine and find out. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, And if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul, again, this week tells us to follow his example. Paul had been through something. He suffered for the Lord. And if he could rejoice in the midst of everything he went through, then he want us to rejoice as well. He's saying you can do it as well. You can go through it and rejoice as well. See, God wants his people to think about things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of a good report. These things help us to be content in the Lord. And these are the kind of things that need to occupy a child of God's mind. See, it's hard to rejoice when we focus on the negative. We are to set our minds on things above. And this 
is what helps us to be content. If we look at what the world is looking at and focus on, it will cause us to want and desire and be anxious or oppressed by the things of the world. But when you keep your eyes on the prize, when you continue to look at Jesus Christ, you can be content no matter what's going on around you. Verses 10 through 12 read, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therefore therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Question six is, how had the Philippians demonstrated their love and concern for Paul? Paul had no doubt about their love for the Philippians for him. It's one thing to say you love a person. It's another thing to show it. The church has showed their love for Paul. And this outpouring of love caused Paul to rejoice in the Lord greatly. See, basically, it made him feel good, so good that he praised God as a result. Question seven says, how did Paul explain the Christian concept of contentment? Paul is saying, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am in. Let me say that again. Paul learned to be content no matter what situation he found himself in. Why? Because he knew that contentment lies not in what he has, but whose he belonged to. See, when you understand who you belong to, you can be content in that situation. When we come into relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, we understand whose we belong to and what we have. A lack of contentment causes a person to look horizontally instead of vertically. When we look horizontally, we look at what others have. So we become never satisfied because we have a spirit that wants us to covet. See, contentment invites us to look vertically, to look at God. When I look in his direction, regardless of my lack of possessions or my lack of status, I know I'm still enough. Why? I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Even if I may not have it here in the physical, I have it in the supernatural. I have it as a child of God. So contentment comes from a joyful dependence upon God, regardless of the circumstances. By drawing upon God's sufficient resources, as a child of God, we have peace even during the most challenging times of our lives because we know we can be content because God is on our side. Question 8 says, why was Paul able to be confident in the face of earthly challenges? The answer is found in one of the most known verses in the Bible, verse 13. But notice before reading it, it is referring to being content. Paul gives us an ever-present help to help us to be content. Let's read it now. Let's find out what it is. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Paul says, I can, meaning I am made able or permitted to be content in this case. Not by my strength, but by the strength of the Lord. Meaning it is continuing by the means of his strength only that he provides that it helps us to be content. He wrote this verse to help us in the midst of struggles and trials. That our circumstances don't have to dictate our happiness. He's saying that he has learned to be content regardless of whether he is doing good in life or whether he's doing bad. Paul says, no matter what, if I'm hungry or whether I'm being well fed, if I'm a free man or whether I'm in prison, Paul is saying nothing, no, not nothing can stop me from being content. Why? Because Christ strengthens me. See, When we understand how Christ strengthens us, we can face any challenge that we go through because we know we're not alone. We know that the strength of Christ is there to help us alone. He did not depend on any personal resources. No, all he depended on was Christ Jesus. 
See, the promise of 4 and 13 is that even though we face hardships and we go through these trials and tribulations by the will of God, we know that God can bring us through. Not only that, but we can have peace, joy, and be content even in the darkest hour. We can learn to be content when we don't allow our circumstances to determine our joy. When we know that in our weakness, God is made strong. When we know that all things work together for the good of them that are, that are loved and are called according to the purpose of God. Knowing that we can be content when I have Jesus because he's the strength we need to help us to get through any situation that we come against. And this is what Paul is trying to show us, that we can do it all. We can be content through it all when Christ is the very source of our strength. Verses 14 through 18 read, Notwithstanding ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but only you. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Euphrates the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Question nice is why were the Philippians especially worthy of gratitude for their financial support? The gift that they gave Paul, Paul had received it at a time when he was in desperate need. It allowed Paul to be able to have the resources needed to continue to press on. See, the Philippian church was the only church that gave in assistance to the movement of the gospel. They were an instrument God used to further the gospel. Question 10 says, how did Paul describe the Philippian gift? Paul said that this here gift was acceptable and pleasing sacrifice to God. Paul may have been the recipient, but all the honor went to God. When we allow God to use us to bless others, God gets the glory. That's what it is all about giving. That's why giving is worship. Worship comes from our giving when we do it in a way that we're trying to honor God. We're not trying to get puffed up about putting money into the pot. No, we want God to use us to be a blessing so we can bless someone else. God wants you to be a conduit that the blessing passes through you to other people. And this is what we see here. The Philippian church was a conduit. It allowed the blessing to flow through to other people. Amen. So as I conclude this lesson, I want to ask a question. Where does contentment reside? Contentment is of the heart. This is the very core area God desires to have. This is where he can put all the spiritual blessings, the spiritual gifts at. It's in the heart of man. See, contentment isn't about denying our feelings, about wants, or desires that a person, what we can or can't have. But it's all about the freedom of being in control of those feelings. See, contentment isn't pretending things are right when they are not. It's all about the peace that comes from knowing that God is bigger than any problem or any situation that's in our lives, that he can work them all out for his good. Contentment isn't a feeling of keeping circumstances under control. It's an atmosphere that we can have an unspeakable joy in spite of our circumstances. That we can look to God who never varies, who never turns, knowing that he's always there by our side. See, contentment is not based on external circumstances, but it's rather based on an internal source. That source is Jesus Christ. This is why contentment is of the heart. We should desire what Paul desired, that enduring commitment, that deep down so satisfying contentment to know that no matter what we find ourselves in, we can overcome it if we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson on learning to be content for the Lord. If the lesson has helped you or benefited you, we love to hear from you. As always, please hit that thumbs up button, drop us a line or two, and subscribe to our channel. I pray God blesses you through this holiday season. And as always, come back next week, same time, same channel. 
Be blessed now.